Hello and welcome to episode 102 of the Brass Junkies. I am your host, Andrew Hitz, and I am joined by the talented, inspiring, and introspective euphonium superstar Lance LeDuc. Lance, how are you? Eh. <laughs> I'm happy because when this uh, episode, I will be in Cancun. You you are in so, Cancun as we speak. I'm Cancun, kind of, yeah, sort I'm of. Listening to this on the beach right <laughs> now in Cancun. I'm listening to me talking to me. His brand new wife is super pissed because he is listening to himself rather than paying attention to her on their honeymoon. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, I somehow doubt that. So, um, <laughs> congratulations! Frank, very. Oh, thank you very much. Hey, congratulations on getting married. I really do think second time's a charm. I do too. I'm very, very excited. <laughs> yes, you got a good. I know one. You only partially mean that. No, I, I actually. <laughs> well, I was being a wise ass, but I do mean it. I mean, you know, you know, you don't. I'm you super nev- excited. Never yeah, let the truth good. get in the way of a good joke. So, yeah, fair so point. I'll sound sarcastic, even though it's a very genuine. Uh, yeah, people aren't used to well, us being you. like sentimental and sweet to each other. Let's not. Also let's true. not lose patrons. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't want to wish you luck so much that people stop paying us. So, um, so yeah. So, <laughs> I don't think you're supposed to say that. So, but either good luck, good luck with your marriage. <laughs> I don't think that's the right terminology. So that's just like when I refer to when I refer to watching my son as babysitting. My wife, my wife says, "You literally cannot babysit your own kid. It's called parenting." I'm like, "Well, yeah, fair enough." <laughs> tomato, tomato. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's kind of ba- I mean, it's kind of baby. It's like babysitting without. Yeah, without any uh, compensation. He's a baby, and I'll be sitting most of the time. <laughs> oh goodness! Hey, I was crazy inspired by uh, this talk today. I, yes, I haven't talked to Joe in a million years, and uh, he had a very different and much healthier approach to being a member of the United States Air Force Band than I did. That's not a really? high bar, but but yes, yes, he did. Uh, we haven't even told them who the guest is yet. Oh, yeah. uh, it is, uh, although I'm, I'm guessing you probably read it in the title, but it is Joe Jackson, who is the uh, retired uh, principal trombone, lead trombone, excuse me, is what they call it, of the Airmen of Note, uh, and uh, an arranger and a composer, and uh, yeah, he, he gigs a lot. It's, yeah, he's, he's a fascinating dude. What a thoughtful yeah, he's guy. he's a thinker. Yeah, yes. that's right. Yep, but he's like he's a thinker who does things about it. You know, there are, I I think I've met a lot of people that think about stuff as much as him. Are you playing marbles? I'm what? sorry, I keep dropping crap. I have four hundred. <laughs> it sounds like I, you're uh... playing marbles. But anyway, I'll go back to it. So the uh, I was like, I'll let the first one go. But the eighth, like, what the hell are you doing? Uh, so the kids, keep, it's re- batteries. So there's a battery recycling thing at CMU. So I we have two teenage boys in the house. So we're going through batteries like crazy because they're game controllers right so there's a mountain of recy- batteries to be recycled on my desk right now and they keep falling over because i keep hitting the fingers <laughs> uh, uh, maybe maybe don't uh, but uh a lot of people that think about stuff as much <laughs> as much as joe my bad does. sorry oh uh, you sorry. sound really 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 oh. sorry I'm going to pray for Hannah. Good Lord. It's everywhere. Most people who think about stuff as much as Joe does aren't, I I don't think, are as good as he is at doing as well. You know, it's like it can be easy to get wrapped up in the thought process and then not the doing thing. And he's... He's got one hell of a balance for both of them, but as you're going to hear, and then we went deep on the bonus episode too on like programming. That was like that was mm-hmm. the most succinct explanation of how to program a concert that I've ever heard in my life. Yeah, I dug it. He he alludes to it in the thing, and yes, and and he talks about it. But then like Lance, like the first thing you, Lance brings up in the bonus episode is like a deep dive into programming, like really really helpful. So. Uh, speaking of which, if you become a Patreon patron, uh, like you, Joe Jackson, has like Joe Jackson yeah. has, yeah, how about that? So um, he became one just the other day, and um, and he's he's been listening for a while, and said he'd been meaning to for a while. And I thanked him. I said, "Now we're going to go easy on him." And he immediately texted back and said, "Do not go easy on me. That makes for bad radio." So 
um, which I thought was funny. But uh, for $1 an episode, you can listen to bonus episodes, which we do um, with each guest, which comes out one week after the original. We've also got some new options. Very quickly, $3 an episode, you get the uh, the monthly uh, TBJ Behind the Scenes Report, which talks uh, all about the inner workings of the podcast, including future guests and things like that. Uh, if you go to $5 per episode, then you get two more things. You get the Music Practice Coach podcast with Lance, which is, again, all of these are monthly, uh, which is a monthly feature from Lance uh, based on his um, his great book, uh, Music Practice Coach. You also get a Jacob's Quotes podcast episode from me. I run the at Jacob's Quotes Twitter feed, which is all quotes from Arnold Jacobs, and I choose one or two, and then I riff on them and how I apply those to my teaching and then and to my own playing. And then at $10 an episode, you get two more things in addition to all the rest of that, which is Deep Thoughts by Lance, which is a deep dive by Lance on something music-related that he is uh, is really into. And then also, I've uh, had the performance and pedagogy blog at andrewhits.com for geez coming up on a decade now and the uh, performance and pedagogy podcast is going to be uh, me riffing on some of my thoughts on performance and uh, on teaching so uh, those are for one three five and ten dollar levels you can go to patreon.com slash the brass junkies where you can learn more and the podcast will forever and always remain free and uh, but for those of you who help support it uh, and value it enough to give us a little bit of your money boy we we cannot thank you enough so i'm excited about this first uh, deep dive or deep thoughts uh, with lance i put together at your suggestion I chronicled uh, how I wrote the, my most recent comedy song, which was done for a, a retirement party for the guy who's the pres- outgoing president of KHS America. So awesome. you'll hear early stra- scratch tracks when I was trying to figure out mm. the riff and then when I was coming up with the words. So and that's- I kind of revisited it over the course of the month leading up to the thing. And then I'll record the tune itself here before I post it so you can hear what the finished product sound like. And that is already posted if you are listening to us right now. So, uh, yep, head to Patreon.com for that. Also, a big thank you to everyone who's left us a rating and a review on iTunes or an Apple Podcasts or uh, whatever app you consume, the Brass Junkies. So, without further ado, let us get to... <laughs> to, to <laughs> How long were you holding those? Just waiting for you're such a jackass. So, without further ado, let's get to our conversation with trombonist Joe Jackson. And today on the Brass Junkies, we are joined by a friend of ours. We, we Lance and I were talking, and we realized that the that the interview after Sam Palafian's like amazing interview was really getting thrown under the bus. So we were like, you know, who should we who should we throw under the bus? And Lance said, actually, I know this guy named Joe Jackson. He plays the trombone, and he'd be the perfect guy to throw under the bus. So, Joe, thank you for joining us. This 93.7, Steelers Nation Radio. I got a bone to pick with Jens. <laughs> hey, hey. hey. You bunch of jagoffs. <laughs> you jagoffs. You guys don't they know gotta how to They got to fire somebody. I don't care. Got to get that kicker out of here. Yeah. Uh, jagoffs. <laughs> no, it's a great honor. Or I'd like to say it's a great honor. I mean, you guys... You guys and me both know I just answered the Craigslist ad for a podcast guest. <laughs> it says it said must own euphonium. But <laughs> <laughs> we figure the more that are owned, the fewer that are out on the yeah. street. Yeah, the, <laughs> we need true. a we Lance. We need to instigate a euphonium buyback plan. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <a> really good <laughs> idea. <laughs> <laughs> I think that is a good idea, right? Yeah. Uh, actually, we yeah there there are some uh, we. <laughs> I was gonna say serpent. That's not what it's called. What's the what's the stand up tuba with the kickstand called? That's in the Verdi <laughs> operas. <laughs> I, can't, I can't. I can't even. I it's can't even. A unituba. I can't even think of the name. 
Oh, um, tube cycle. Yeah, there you go. All right, let's actually not say the correct name so that the people who get really upset, like I bet Michael Parker is gonna, is gonna text me with a bunch of f bombs in all caps. So, um, yeah, it's it's a. I guess it's more like a serpent with a kickstand. <laughs> so the, the awful Clyde. Yeah. This thing, thank you. Thank you very much. So who are we talking to? Joe Jackson. That's right. So, so Joe, you play the you play the trombone. Is that right? Occasionally. <laughs> Yeah, I do actually own trombones. I don't actually own a euphonium. I have a, I, I have a baritone. Does that count? It's like an old yep. um, three valver. It's that counts. Baritones and euphoniums bucks. are the same thing. It's great. According to Lance, if you don't agree with that, then email Lance. <laughs> yeah, please. <laughs> <laughs> don't care at Google dot whatever. <laughs> Google dot <youth. laughs> yeah. That's right. No trombonist, uh, arranger, um, you know, and then all kinds of other things. I'm kind of a, a Swiss Army knife uh, gig machine person, so whatever it is, if it pays money, I do it. Wait, I'm writing down Swiss Army knife gig machine person for the show notes. So that's the S A K G M P trademark. For those of you who have not checked out the show notes, it's actually kind of it's kind of fun because if you read them without context, they, they make absolutely no sense and yeah. they'll make maybe some sense if you are listening while you read them they're almost like easter eggs just to try and figure out yeah. how lance's brain works it's, that's right yeah <laughs> it's not they're not really helpful to anyone but lance but it keeps them occupied it keeps them off the streets so we just you know yeah that's we let them run with it so yeah so joe let's uh we're gonna we we will get into what what you do uh but uh, i wanted to talk about your parents you come from a musical family yeah yeah, uh, my dad was a what? <laughs> I don't know. The way you reacted. It seemed like you. It, it almost. The, you, it sounded like you were like vamping, like you were trying to pull up notes to like remember, like what have I publicly said about my imaginary family? Like, wait, was it my mom was a flute? I'm no, no, no. She was a clarinetist. She was a professional clarinetist. No, actually, I'm I'm anticipating the pedagogical questions. I'm pulling up the Wikipedia article on how to play the trombone. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, as Lance likes to point out, he learned how to do it, so it can't be that hard. So you can you can learn anything on YouTube now. That's what my daughter told That's me. That's true. That is yeah. true. Wow. Yeah, he's right. Yeah, well. yeah. Mom was a clarinet player, uh, classical, played in symphonies, and she was in Fort Wayne Philharmonic for a while back in the seventies. And uh, then my dad was a trombonist. Uh, he was kind of like me, except he was a primarily a classical guy that crossed over and played like all kinds of stuff. Whereas I'm a jazz guy that I try to cross over and play all kinds of stuff. But he played in the Fort Worth Symphony. He was principal down there for about six or seven years. And um, and then he stopped like in 1990 and started becoming like a recording engineer. And uh, yeah. So he does weddings and bar mitzvahs now. You know, <laughs> he's, he's available for hire. <laughs> but. <laughs> Uh, and he still does a lot of uh, recording engineering, right? Uh, he's starting to phase out of it. He does okay. a lot of editing now. It's like whatever whatever phase he can do that doesn't involve humping a bunch of equipment out of the house and sure. into a venue, uh, he'll do now. Right. So it's a smart you know, man. He is a he's a smart man. He does it right. I don't do it right. I throw my body around and scratch <laughs> myself, and it's no good. <laughs> Like if they let, if they let me back in the Air Force to do ceremonies, I'd probably still do that. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you record with your dad often? Wait, say that again. You had a little do you record with your dad very often? Uh, no, no. He recorded a couple of Airman and Notes CDs around like uh, 90, 1998, 1999. And what was that, that is, like? That was it. Was really cool. Um, although he was so busy. And then I was doing my thing, you know, trying to play good. And it's, it's like it wasn't even like we were hanging out. It's like we go have lunch together and then it's like, all right, I'll see you in three hours because he and his guy were about to go back and just become techno nerds back and pulling their hair out, trying to find out what's wrong with the, you know, the ground loop hum coming from the bass channel. And, you know, so it was interesting, but it was nice having him up here. I mean. It was a drag for him because he had to drive his equipment up from Dallas up Ooh. here to D.C. And um, those aren't close. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> this geography lesson. <laughs> yeah. <Goodbye. laughs> 
Brought to you by Google Maps. <laughs> I wish. We need to get Google Maps as a sponsor. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so when when you entered the Air Force, I think about the same time as me, or maybe a little after? Can't remember. When did you go in? Uh, I went in fall 1991. Yeah, we went in the exact same time. Well, I got, I got there July, late July. So right. we were within months of each other. We were in closer, but I got recycled in basic training. That's the whole. Thing. Did you really? Yeah. Wait, what does that mean? That doesn't Wait, sound uh, good. So recycle, <laughs> recycled. You want to explain it? Uh, okay, so recycled is when you like uh, get, uh, you basically wash out of your basic training flight and get put in like a remedial flight. <laughs> Because I, I was apparently a terrible airman. <laughs> Did you crash a bunch of planes? <laughs> uh, something like that. Which In a manner of speaking. Yeah, I mean, the terrible airman is like, that's that was the 1991 Air Force fight song. The terrible airman. Hold the on. terrible airman. It was a march by Lance LeDuc. <laughs> <laughs> so wait so hold on i just want to so you said washed out so you so you sucked so bad at basic training that they made you go to like remedial basic training well, well and you, so have to- you can you can get recycled back to day one they can make you like you could be and they threaten you this with with this all the time like mm-hmm. they talk, and there was a guy who was on the plane he was getting ready to go get on the plane to go home and he flipped off the is and we stopped the bus and told him he was recycled to day one <laughs> and they kind of wheeled this over you the whole time. Sure. So, and you get recycled that was for amazing. any number of reasons. <laughs> um, it could be behavioral. It could be that you you failed some tests. It could be that you were a jackhole and said the inappropriate <laughs> things to the wrong person. Um, it could be that you got sick. It could be that there was a family emergency and you had to come back and then they recycled you into the whatever. But now I want to know, so Joe, what was it that caused you to get to recycle? How well, did, you, did you get recycled? So you have to understand what the competition is there. I mean, I'm going up against people who have the choice between going to jail and going into the airport. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're really highly motivated people down there. Um, when did you start basic training? Uh, seriously, the reason I got uh, recycled before you go there uh, okay. is I forgot to button a button on my lightweight blue jacket. Okay, so it was like a very big, important thing. Yeah, it was a really... <laughs> Dude, you know, this is our national security, Joseph. Yeah. You seem very Attention flippant to about it. Attention detail, gentlemen. <laughs> I, went, uh, I, I went in September 1991. Okay, so, yeah. yeah. Well, so you weren't that... How, how You didn't get recycled that far, did you? At two weeks. Two weeks? Yeah. Good gravy. It wow. was great. And so how long I were you it. in that purgatory <laughs> flight? Uh, there's, there's like, I went straight to the, like the two weeks. Oh, later you went. Flight. Uh, and then, well, they were all you, brand new, and I was like, "Well, I've been here for two weeks. You guys don't know anything." <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you one thing: <laughs> keep your buttons buttoned. No yeah, kidding. I'm like, I didn't make that mistake again. I had two weeks to prepare for it. It was like Groundhog Day. <laughs> Did you do the the drum abuse core thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I Those played guys like, were pretty I, good. I, I played like a melophonium, and they like. Wait, what's you know, that? So they knew I was going to premier. I don't know. It's like a. It looks like a flugelhorn, but it's it's in the same range as a euphonium. Does it have a kickstand? It, oh, that was the it, thing it, I would have played. It has a kickstand and it has a chord start. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I was, I was just taking a sip of coffee. That almost ended badly. <laughs> <laughs> they knew I was going to a premiere band, so they had like this field day, and the band was playing like theme from Rocky, and he just pointed to me. He's like, "Blow," and I'm like, "I'm a slide trombonist." <laughs> And so I just started spinning the valves and going, blah, 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 you know, like doing a manner. You know, he loved it. <laughs> Rubes. Uh, so, oh, God. So the drum and bugle thing uh, that you guys just, what, what, is, what is that? That's within basic training? Yeah, if you have any musical ability, well. <laughs> They're playing a little loose with that, but anyway. I'll, we'll say it that way, yeah. So. <laughs> And they have this little drum and bugle core that they'll stick together, and it gets you out of KP. You don't have to do any of the KP. So instead, mm-hmm. you get together. Which for, is Kitchen Patrol? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A couple of hours a day. You guys are and throwing around acronyms rehearsed, and, yeah. like, dropping and recycling and, like, yeah, like you, you slow down, man. Mm-hmm. Slow down. <laughs> there you go. K. Catch up. <laughs> P. I thought I knew that one, but I wanted to make so, sure. So, And, uh, Joe, were you also so, down? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. do... 
you would do parades or ceremonies or so we went and did the watermelon parade and i don't know somewhere outside <laughs> of the was, base somewhere in san Antonio. Well, you guys so, performed okay. off base yeah then they let us go to our locker where, or wherever it was that they took all your crap when you got there and we could take a little bit of money and uh uh buy you know slushies or whatever the hell it was <laughs> we go to the watermelon festival wow Joe, you were like wow. you were like a month after Lance. You got an extra two weeks. Lance not only didn't get any extra time, he got slushies. I did. I got a slushy. That's right. Uh, Jerry, <laughs> memory serves. <laughs> Jerry. Yeah. Well, the, uh, actually, they took us to a Spurs game. Oh, that's better. Yeah. Okay. That was cool. That's better than a slushy. Yeah, I saw Definitely David better. Robinson live. Wow. Wow. Yeah. He, Basic training too. It was that's pretty good. Yeah. Wow. There you go. So two extra. So did you? So you were also yeah. That, at that same. What's the name of the base down there outside of San Antonio? Lackland. Lackland. So here's here's a question, Joe. How I think that your brain and my brain are in some ways wired similarly, and keeping your mouth shut identically. <laughs> did you just pee a little bit too? <laughs> just yeah. okay. Good. I just had so, another sip of coffee in my mouth. It's the first one since the last time you said something funny. Knock it off. <laughs> So how was it? I mean, for me, the biggest challenge was just keeping my mouth shut in the face of abject idiocy. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) That's that's like a music career, like in a nutshell. But anyway, just watching these things go on and just forcing my mouth closed, like don't say anything to anyone. So how did you survive that? That was for sure the hardest part. Well, I mean, you know, like the when I first got there, I was the I did the whole you know, basic training social justice warrior thing. You know, I was like <laughs> trying to fix things and and you know then I got then I got recycled and like you know, I think I believe that failure like having a setback like you guys are talking about you had to stay there for two extra weeks. I I literally honestly value that that happened to me because that hmm. you know it it like taught me that to keep my head down. I mean, it, it taught me a lot of things. It, it was, I really liked getting recycled despite the fact that the note, the airman note was mad because yeah, I was going to be there two weeks later and they were counting on me to coming back and doing a tour. Um, but no, I actually dug that. So that was kind of, you know, I kind of got there and I was trying to get the, you know, fix things and improve the process. And, yeah. and that's what they want. Really, is a lot <laughs> that's of outside that's input. really not what they're looking for. <laughs> Same thing when you sub on an orchestra gig and a professional orchestra, exactly. they always love it. If you can give some, just some, an outsider's opinion on like processes yeah, see, and how the rehearsals flowing and that kind of thing. Yeah. Right. So, you know, you're coming out of school and you have all this, this really idealistic view of the universe and it's experiences like that, that inform you that there are ways to, improve things without overtly you know like getting in there and becoming comfortable and working within the system and that's what i tried to do my entire air force career it's what i still try to do in my civilian career it's like you know what are we unless we're agents of change and agents of making things better right mm-hmm. it's like it's like we're parents you know the the goal of parents is always to make your kids a little bit better than you and for me that was really easy but you know you're trying to you're trying to, everybody's trying to leave the planet in a little better shape than they found it and um the question is what's the most effective way to do that and in air force basic training the way not to do that is to go in there and open your your yammer <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's like a that's like a frustratingly uh, mature outlook. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> that's great. Well, that's, that's what I've become in my old age—a frustratingly mature person. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll appreciate this. I've told this on the show before, but I'm going to tell it again because it was one of my favorite basic training stories. It was a mail call day, and. At the time, I had like six TIs. They, they gave us the TIs that were always like four days from retirement. Then it was the person that was two weeks before they were going on leave. And then it was somebody who just they were waiting for a regular flight. So it was just this revolving door of, of drill instructors. Yeah. And so we had this guy, um, this like, I think he was from the Bronx or someplace. He's, oh, blah, blah, blah. His arms were like tree trunks. And so we're all sitting there waiting for the mail. And he's like, look, and he turns the envelope over and he says, oh, I see you eight one two. What does that mean? 
<laughs> I know two things instantly. This is from my father, and I'm dead. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, I see you ate one, too. What is that? What does that mean? Oh, I... And then he figures it out, like, the third time around, and he, he <coughs> like, freezes, and then he slowly crumples the letter up. <laughs> oh, my God. Chucks it at my head. Oh, jeez. And so then... Um, but four days later, you, we're in the bowling alley, and we have the ability to have grilled cheese sandwiches and call home. So there's a big line on the pay phones to call collect home. And so <laughs> I call home and uh, <laughs> collect call, and my dad is, like, waiting for the phone. And so um, he picks up, and I go, hey, Dad, I got your letter. And that was the last thing I heard him say because he was laughing so hard. Like the phone dropped. He had to go get my mom to put her on the phone because he, he just could not hold his way through it. Yeah. I still have actually. We'll have to. Uh, I have actual proof. It's, it's still slightly crumpled. Just like me. <laughs> just like you. Yeah. And then, and then there's a day that the TI figures out that you're about to outrank them in six weeks. That's always a wonderful yeah. moment. How'd that go for you? I remember the exact quote. Actually. Well, and quickly, how do they how do they figure that out? You get your orders. They, there's like everybody like you're going at when basic training's done. This person is going to be deployed to tech school for to be a mechanic. This one is going to uh, off at Air Force Base. This one's going to wherever. And then ours said you're going to Washington D.C. to play in the Air Force Band. And with that, like it tells you what your rank will be as well. Because some if you came in and you had a little bit of college, then you might come out as an E2 or an E3 or something. And we're instantly going to an E6, and a lot of the TIs are E5s. And so we will literally outrank them in two weeks. Jeez. That's <laughs> true. So how did that go down? Well, it happened twice. It happened early when they're like looking over the list, and I happen to have a, a gal that knew that premier band means that there's a rank incentive that I'm going to get promoted to E6 as soon as I leave basic. And she just kind of shook her head. She didn't make a big deal out of it, but she was mm -hmm. you know, hard on me after that. But then after I got recycled, I had this guy. And like, like I said, man, when I got recycled, it gave me like this two-week advantage, and it totally readjusted. You know, so I'm like, I got to get out of here. So I'm like, I'm going to play this game as hard as I can play it. And I became like a star basic training trainee. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was, I was like the honor flight dorm guard. I like did all this stuff. So by the end of it, my, uh, my TI loved me. Like it was weird. I was like, I became like, you know how like all professional musicians were like a star in their high school. They were a star musician in their high school. Right. And so I, I'm just like, okay, I'm, I'm not a trombone player right now. I'm a professional military trainee. So I'm just going to I'm going to go after this as hard as I go after the trombone. <laughs> and I mean, you know, it's funny, but in a way it's it's not funny because, you know, I sold out for my country. But um, but yeah, so he didn't really care if I was getting promoted. He's like he thought I should be an officer. Wow. Yeah, that's <laughs> my experience. Yeah. Different. My T.I. My second T.I. loved me. It was weird. Very strange. That is weird. Yeah. No, so it was this woman, about. and I don't remember her name, probably just as well. And she got, you know, a half an inch in front of my face. <laughs> she goes, "Nice, That's you hot. are a sorry ass individual." <laughs> <laughs> and you got a little turned on. Come on, admit it. Uh, Ma'am, yes, ma'am. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> you expect after they go, sorry, Ash, you expect something a little spicier than individual. Individual. <laughs> like, like, it's like, thank you for acknowledging my unique <laughs> qualities. <laughs> You're a sorry, ass, but valued individual. <laughs> so... So Joe, you just talked about how all musicians are the you know the star of their band, but uh, not everybody had quite the um, had quite the trophy case that you did from their childhood. So I'm going to get to that in just a second. But first, I want to thank Parker Mouthpieces for providing the hosting for the Brass Junkies. Parker Mouthpieces offers fine, customizable component mouthpieces for horn, trombone, euphonium, tuba, and kickstand tuba, including the Andrew Hitz Artist Model Tuba Mouthpiece and the Lance LeDuc Model Euphonium Mouthpiece. Mm. You can find out more at parkermouthpieces.com or follow them on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. 
And please email Parker and ask him if he has any mouthpieces that come with a kickstand. <laughs> yes. Go to ParkerMouthpieces.com. Every time that we send people to his website, uh, Michael, get, like to, to send him stupid emails, he gets mad. And he's one of my best friends. So it obviously makes me happy when he's mad. So, um, so you can be doing me a favor. And also, he ends up selling mouthpieces. So he ends up long-term not being mad, but... It, yeah, everybody wins. So just harass him. It's it's the right thing to do. So, uh, Joe, you won uh, three Downbeat Magazine DB Awards uh, when you were uh, obviously in high school. And then, uh, well, it'd be kind of unfair, I guess, if you won high school awards when you were like in the Airmen of Note. Um, and then uh, you you also won you also won the uh, the the National Association of Jazz Educators College Musician of the Year in 1985 as a college student. Um, so uh, what talk to us talk to us about that? What's a DB award? A uh, DB award is a uh, it's a like a student music award given out by Downbeat Magazine. Um, and so they do it just like the readers and the critics awards. They have different categories based on instrument for arrangements for you know, recordings. And, um, so every year uh, people get nominated and then they send in a package and then, you know, the DB, the downbeat editors get together and listen to things and look at it and decide who is the winner and the runner up and all that. It's, it's exact same as the, the readers awards and the critics polls. So, so it's like winning an Oscar, but different. Yeah, it's it's like it's winning a very local Oscar, like <laughs> your zip code. No, um, so I had this amazing. I had a couple of really amazing band directors, and and that's like anybody in this business knows how in, how critical a great band director can be early in your career because it's at that beginning stage when you're like really getting into the instrument and really starting to bear down and work on it as opposed to, you know, coast on natural ability. That's, that's what is going to determine. We've seen it over and over again. That's what's going to determine whether somebody really takes off and has a career in this business. And um, I had it when I was lived in Indiana, I had a great band director at Northrop High School in Fort Wayne named Barry Ashton. And then I came down to Texas and I went to the, uh, to Booker T. Washington School for the Performing Arts. And I had this great band director named Bart Morantz. And the thing about Bart Morantz is, he, like, he was a great band director, really fine teacher, but he was a, an amazing promoter. I mean, hmm. this is a guy, like, Roy Hargrove went to that school. That's wow. where the uh, Edie Burkell and the New Bohemians came wow. through. Wow. And Bart Morantz was a huge part of each one of our careers. Hmm. And the thing about Bart is, like, you know, he, like, comes, he shows up. I start going to the school. He hears me, and he's like, okay, we're going to enter you in this and this and this. And he starts, like, just, he's, like, going crazy. She's like sending out like I think my first couple of DB awards, I didn't even see the package that he sent. Wow. So I like all at once I found out, you know, you've won this award or these awards and, you know, yay for you. And but it was all it was all Bart Morantz. I mean, all I did was, you know, play the trombone and but he was he was an incredible promoter. And and then you're right, like that created buzz. So I actually went to University of North Texas um, right out of high school, and they like already knew who I was. Wait, and you went I, to college right out of high school? Right, yeah, <laughs> I did. <laughs> I did. I, I mean, I flunked out, but you got recycled. <laughs> yeah, I, I got recycled in college too. Um, but yeah, it was, it was like that program is so huge. The jazz program is so huge to show up there, and people already kind of know who you are and are talking about you. Hmm. It's it's, I mean, it's not a huge advantage. You still have to, you know, win auditions. You still have to go up there and play well. But uh, that it was kind of, it felt like I kind of had a leg up there, hmm. you know, that because of my band director. He was a great promoter. Wow. Okay. Is yeah. he still teaching? Uh, n I think he's retired from band directing at Booker T. Washington. Yeah. Have you had to, have you, how much interaction did you have with them after you graduated? With, uh, with my band directors? Yeah. Uh, well, because I just, I, I backed into this opportunity. Uh, you know, it's, we appreciate our music educators and we always talk about it and then not always do we, me especially, I don't, I sort of suck at, have historically sucked at thanking them. And so I, it's, 
I've tried to make it my mission to to reach out to them and and let them know what they've meant to me. I just didn't know if you've had much interaction with with. Uh, I him feel since. I'm I'm exactly on that same wavelength. Um, I mean, I see I see Bart all the time, like or I did for a long time because he went to all the music conventions and of course the Airman and Note would go to IAJ and Gen conferences and stuff like that, and I would always see him and we'd hang out. Um, my first uh, high school band director, Barry Ashton. Uh, I don't. I had. I didn't see him as much, but like over the past couple of years, I've seen him a few times. Uh, he lives in Florida. He's retired now, but he actually went up for the Snyder Jazz Festival in early 2016, and I was hired to come out and be like the featured artist and clinician and judge for that jazz festival. So we got to hang out, and he sells. He has a C's candy kiosk in oh. Florida now, and he brought all this C's candy and. So that was awesome. Cool. <laughs> I'm like, that's my future. I'm going to sell candy. When I retire, I'm going to sell candy. I'm down. Yeah. So we should, uh, it seems that we should talk about the Airman and Note. Yes. Okay. That was next. So uh, talk about the Airman and Note. The Airman and Note is the premier jazz ensemble of the United States Air Force. Boy, what a, what a professional seg. See, we knew that once we got into triple digits, we were going to get real refined. So that was called a professional segue. <laughs> so talk about the Airman of Note. Formed in 1950, it was designed to carry on the tradition of Glenn Miller's Army Air Force's dance band. <laughs> Man, why didn't so, you do this whole interview in narrator voice? Narrative okay. voice is pretty good. So wanna, Friday night, what? What, what is this? Two Monday. So three nights ago, I I conducted this uh, concert. It was with choir and it was uh, this brass group here in Pittsburgh and organ. It was like this stacked out whatever. And the choir director at the rehearsal was like adamant that I remember to have the choir stand up. He was like, just make sure you don't forget to have the choir stand up before. Just make sure you know, like. <laughs> I, okay, is this a hard thing to remember? <laughs> so, of course, you put that in my head, and now I'm standing in front of this packed house, and I was like, well, there's been great deliberation about how to have the choir stand up, and will I remember to do that? And so then I was like, okay, so I'm going to try it right now. Choir, stand up! <laughs> <laughs> ah. Okay, it worked. Everything's fine. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right, enough about the airmen of note. So, yep. Anyway, <laughs> what kind of candy will you sell? <laughs> <laughs> so, I want to talk about this because everybody gets to this moment at one point in their career where, you know, I'm in school, I'm I'm gigging locally. I'm doing some trips with like, you know, some national bands, but I'm trying to figure out the next step, right? We've all been at that point in our careers where nothing's there's nothing obvious. There's not an obvious career path, right? And so I'm like, I'm, I'm treading water in Denton, Texas, and I'm trying to figure out what the next move is. And, and one of those options is like getting out of music. I mean, I, you know, I, I love music. I'm desperately, lo I'm driven to do music. I just, I can't get it out of my system. And yet there was nothing laying out for me. So, but then I got the opportunity uh, because my buddy Keith Oshiro, who I went to school with, was with the Maynard Ferguson band, and he was leaving the Maynard Ferguson band, and I was one of the people he recommended. And so uh, they flew me out, did it like a quick audition, and I got that gig. And I'm like, okay, great. You know, now I can do this for a while, and this is my, you know, this is the next step. So I don't know what's going to happen after this. So that was amazing. It was a great experience. Uh, because of working with Maynard and because of, you know, the rock star status, like when you go play gigs in high schools, it's like the kids were just like going insane. Um, it was literally like being on a, you know, rock band for people who didn't get dates in high school. <laughs> <laughs> and um, <laughs> and uh, so I, I did that for about a year. And then the leader of the Airmen and Known at the time, Pete Berenberg, calls me out of the blue. I was off the road for a couple of weeks he calls me out of the blue and he's like hey look you know you've heard you know who we are um we've been looking for a lead trombone player uh we've had a couple of auditions we're not crazy about the options so far like they didn't hire anybody based on the couple of auditions he said i can't you know we know who you are i can't offer you the gig 
here over the phone. You have to do an audition. So I'm wondering if you'd like to come out to DC and do an audition. So I got in my car. I drove straight there. It was like 22 hours. Um, I stayed with my buddy Rich Sigler, who played trumpet mm. in a note, and um, and then went in and did the audition. And it was the, the audition was ridiculous. It was it was like two hours. It was playing lead trombone with some features sprinkled in. It's, it's you know it's like all you for like two hours. And Dave Steinmeier and Rick Lillard were both like at the audition and like <laughs> standing in front of the band, like behind Pete. But like in my line of vision and at the end of every tune, like Dave Steinmeier is like pointing up with his thumbs like, you know, play the high note. <laughs> and I'm just like, I'm in survival mode here. You know, I'm <laughs> who are the, who are those two guys? Yeah, yeah. Never heard of them. No, <laughs> um, I don't know. They were just a couple of guys they let in. on the street, but, uh, So the audition was, I guess, apparently it went well enough. And they offered me that job. And then the next thing is they send you to basic training. Joe Jackson gets recycled. He makes <laughs> friends with the TI. He gets out of basic. He flies up to D.C. And after immediately missing a tour. gets... After, no, he, I, they drove me up to the tour. Oh, like wow. My first, first day out of basic, they drove me up to Pennsylvania. <laughs> you guys ever been to Pennsylvania? <laughs> um, I hear it's nice. Drove me up to Pennsylvania, and like I'm playing a gig that night. And I played second for like three days and then they put me back on leave <laughs> wow yeah so those two guys were two of the legendary members of that section before uh airman jackson got there yeah yeah steinmeier and and lillard those guys put that band on the map yeah i mean everybody listens to bon voyage i mean you know forget about it Forget about so Pete Berenberg, uh was I have one Pete Berenberg story and I feel badly about this story, um, but I'm going to tell it nonetheless because uh, it was funny and it's still funny to me. Mm -hmm. One of the things I liked, I was not a big fan of being in the United States Air Force um, because some people took that part of it very seriously and I take very little very seriously. <laughs> so we would be on Confirm. a bus going somewhere and there would be a bus. Com I'm sorry, a coach. We would be on the coach. And there would be a coach commander. And we were going someplace, and somehow Pete was the coach commander. And I was way in the back of the bus. And one of my favorite things to do to a bus commander, I'm sorry, coach commander from the back of the coach was to say, and he was a chief master sergeant, so you referred to them as chief. Are there any, so they would make all these announcements. Are there any questions? And I would raise my hand. Tech Sergeant LeDuc. Yeah, chief, when we get there, we've got to come to, to um, four, four o'clock. <laughs> he would go, <laughs> what? <laughs> I said, at four o'clock we got to twist to, 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 to again then he said I can't hear what you're saying and I was like just never mind never mind it doesn't matter <laughs> and he had this look on his face like I'm, I'm, dude I'm trying to help you I don't know what because he, he's like super nice uh, I just but I couldn't stop myself I'm sorry Pete yeah yeah <laughs> yeah Pete, Pete would not necessarily be on that wavelength no he yeah no. Yeah. Not with the irony. No. Yeah. yeah, I love how this this whole interview started about like Joe with this like legit inspiring attitude about basic training and getting recycled, and Lance is pretending that a cell signal that is non-existent is breaking up from the back of a coach. <laughs> like, Before cell phones were invented, yes, by the way, exactly. the two airmen, oh, which, not, which is quite amazing if you think about it. Right? Yeah, he was. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, Schwarzkopf had one at that point, but that was yeah. about it. So yeah. yeah. It was it, as big as his Jeep. Yes. Jeep sports cop? <laughs> uh, Nelson Schwarzkopf, the Penn's goalie, 1973. <laughs> you jag off. You jag off. <laughs> so, uh, there's, uh, so you were the leader of the Airmen of Note after a while. What, what does that job entail? Uh, so I was the director. Oh, oh, excuse and, me. Um, excuse me. Sorry. Yeah. And uh, so what happened is like when Pete was there, leader and music director, it was all one person. Right. So Pete ran everything. He ran the rehearsals. He programmed the gigs. Uh, he figured out, he produced all the CDs. He he like did everything. 
And uh, after Pete left, they split that up. So Joe Eckert was the music director. Oh, right. And uh, C.E. Askew was the enlisted leader. They call it the non-commissioned officer in charge. And um, so after Joe Eckert and C.E. Askew left, Dudley Hino and I were put in charge of the band. So my job was to do, like, the content, right? And Dudley's job was to administratively run the band and deal with what came down from upstairs right and um so i basically uh oversaw all the musical content of the band it's like what what are we going to play what uh you know what kind of themes are we going to have for our summer concert series um you know what what are we going to put on this what's our next cd going to be i'd go upstairs and pitch cd ideas to the commander commander would make a decision and then i would do that project you know we had arrangers and we'd have them arrange certain tunes and and we like to do themed uh cds and that was like that was something i was really focused on uh during my time as director which started in 2004 and ended in 2011 so i'd been in the band for about 13 years when i was made the director and uh, that that was a big deal because what we also did is we uh we had a renewed focus on promoting our cds we actually hired a promoter whose job was basically to uh, cultivate a list of media outlets and print media, radio, radio media, online media, and and then like send the recordings to these people, but follow up with phone calls and say, hey, are are you spinning this? Are you playing this? What's the response like? What do you like about the CD? What do you not like about the CD? What's what's resonating with your listening public, right? And uh, and they would develop metrics to send back to us, which I could then use to take upstairs and justify doing more recording projects and this system was working really good and like i said one of the things we did is we would theme our recordings you know so we had never done or at least not in about 25 years done a live cd so you know we had we now had like a pro tools rig and a splitter so we went on these we we go on these community relations tours that lasted about three weeks and we took out our pro rules Pro Tools rig, and we just recorded every single night. Well, so in in a given tour, you know, we'd have two openers. We'd have a couple of second tunes. We'd have three or four features. Um, we'd have about a half dozen vocal tunes, and we kind of rotate them every night, but by the end of a tour, we'd have like eight to ten recordings of every single tune in our program. Hmm. So we get back to D.C., and we we have all these recordings, so we just go through and pick the best take of every single tune that we wanted to put on a live album and then you know we put in the crowd noise at the front end and back end of every single cut and we came up with airman and out live which is one of my favorite recordings that we ever did um in the note um so we did that we had a uh, composition cd that featured all original compositions from people in the band um we did keep them flying the, the boss wanted a glenn miller record so we found like some old Glenn Miller recordings that were very, you know, World War II centric. And, um, and we transcribed those and played those and just tried to make it as authentic as possible. Uh, you know, we, we rehearse Glenn Miller music. Um, we, I, and that's the thing is you have to take everything seriously. There, there's a propensity in the hip jazz world to take swing music or especially, you know, like a commercial swing music, like Glenn Miller could have been considered at the time, and just kind of poo-poo it. It's like, we'll just read that on the gig. It's like, no. For, for one thing, it puts the band in a bad energetic position hmm. to be playing music on stage that you're not really taking seriously. So we took everything deadly seriously. We, we listened to the recordings. You know, we would try to emulate, you know, the period sound. We tried to play authentically. You know, it's just like an orchestral repertoire you're going to play different material differently based on the repertory requirements of that music Mm -hmm. so we were very serious about everything we did and then my favorite project that we did was uh cool yule which is where we took um christmas songs you know the boss told us to do a christmas cd it's like yes sir christmas cd coming up and uh we took every like a christmas song and we would pair it with like a, a iconoclastic a big band song like sing 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 Mm. combined with jingle bells and so every single tune was like a mashup like we did i I did an arrangement of i'll be home for christmas 
that sounds just like Moonlight Serenade. Um, we did uh, All Lang Syne, like the T for two, like the, that classic, you know, uh, Latin arrangement of T for two. You know, so we did all these mashup tunes and that one just like that started getting added to all kinds of like department store feeds that that one went nuts and it mm. uh, there's a there's a chart in the jazz world called the jazz week chart and that album actually ended up at number two which at that time was unprecedented for any military band i think um so that was kind of the the uh th it was great having that positive feedback you know and just kind of a validation that what you're doing is working you know we're trying to get we're trying to, to, to send the air force message you know that's a, that's our job as the air force band is to tell the air force story send the air force message blah 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 and um but we were also trying to make air force music and specifically the music of the airman a note uh kind of more of a household name the way it had been uh or was threatening to be in the 70s and 80s due to you know guys like Steinmeier and Rick Lillard and mm -hmm. Von Nark and all that. And so Von Nark, well, I haven't thought about him in a while. Von Nark, yeah. See, we keep coming back to Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I, I was just thinking about the, the, this is the, you had the opportunity that I wished I always had and would have stuck around there if I had, which was some kind of venue to be creative and just sort of run as far and as fast as I, my little brain would let me. Yeah, yeah. that's cool as hell. And that's all that you got to do that. It's, uh, it makes, it's just fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. It was a great privilege. And I think really, I mean, I tell that story about basic training, but that just kind of leads me to what my life position was from that point forward, which is grow where you're planted, mm -hmm. you know? So I, I show up to the note and, you know, after a few years, I'm like, okay, you know, I, I recognize that the music thing is important, but there are there are other things that have to be done here for the airman to note because we don't have, you know, we don't have a PR staff. We don't have a lot of the, you know, outsource resources that a lot of bands do. We do it all in house, you know? So I started asking, can I be a part of this? Can I be a part of that? So I started running the public affairs shop and then I did the tour manager thing for a few years. You know, I kind of did a lot of different jobs and each time I tried to attack the job the same way that I attacked trombone when I was in high school and when I was in college, you know, that just that same maniacal drive to constantly get better, to constantly make things better. And um, so once I removed that, because we as musicians can tend to be super judgy about the content of what we're doing. Is it, is it truly creative? Is it part of making music? Is it composing? You know, but if we can break away from that judgment about the content of what we're doing and apply that same energy and that same discipline to other walks of life, succeeding at those other things can help maneuver us into situations where we can exercise our creativity in like a big way. Um, because in any organization, there's, you know, it takes a certain level of holistic competence to really be able to come back and then do a job like music direct. Because if I have no idea what the publicity people have to do, I'm not going to do an effective job of branding a, a CD. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it helps inform how I'm going to brand the CD because then I, I have a product that, you know, my PR people can send out and they know they can have success with it. So, you know, so I, I I hear you, and and it was a tremendous privilege, and but that's the way to get to a position like it doesn't. It's not like putting a quarter in and you get a certain result, mm -hmm. but I just found that that life position, that attitude, uh, really was instrumental in moving me into positions where I could make a big difference in my world. Mm -hmm. I think there's something. Maybe this is me being grumpy and reinventing history, but it seems like the the parts of the, the Air Force Band is a couple hundred people, and of that, there's the concert band, there's the ceremony band, there's the airman and note, there's, there's the the rock band, the the production staff, all that all things, and yep. some of them had an officer there all the time, and That's others. True. The leadership was from within the group itself. So the rock band, the country band, the um, the strings, the 
the sing well, it's depending, but the the and the ceremonial brass and my sense of it, at least during the period of time that we were there, and maybe that's changed. Those um, those subsets that didn't directly have uh, that a day to day interaction with an officer seemed healthier and happier. I mean, there's definitely dysfunction there, but um, and I, I don't. Maybe it's me just choosing to remember it that way. But I remember you guys. Um, just having to figure it out on your own. And it was way more entrepreneurial and it was way more, uh, there were way more opportunities for you to um, grow and interact uh, uh, across the band rather than in this sort of top-down hierarchical structure. Maybe it's also just the, the size of it as well. You know, there's 65 of us or whatever it was in the concert band. It's sort of unwieldy. Uh, um, but Yeah, I think you nailed it. You, you absolutely nailed it. And it's not just the Air Force. All the service bands in D.C. share that. And, you know, I, I especially now know that because now that I'm retired and I'm freelancing so much, uh, a lot of the people that I see on gigs are the guys that came up in the service jazz bands just like I did at the same time mm -hmm. I did. And they're all retired mm -hmm. now and we're all out there, you know, beating down the gig path. And uh, it's it's the same across all the service bands. Somehow the the jazz bands tend to have more independence they don't have generally they don't have an officer traveling with them i know the jazz ambassadors they have a warrant officer that mm. uh, actually leads the band but the blues the commodores uh the airmen of note um tend to travel just with a uh, senior enlisted it hasn't always been that way like in the early 70s the airmen of note had either a chief warrant officer or a lieutenant or a captain in charge of the band that would travel with the band and stand in front of the band and lead it and count it off and basically was the music director. Okay, I so see. that that all shifted in the mid 70s and then that started being like an E9 job. Okay, so there was a chief master sergeant doing all that kind of stuff. And um but yeah, there are definitely advantages to that. There are a few disadvantages as well. I um, mean, you, you know, in terms of the climate, um I think it feels better for the people in these bands to have that independence and not have, um, yeah, I don't want to be, I don't want to choose wrong words here. That to have somebody that hasn't gone through the jazz process, mm -hmm. the, the, the process of learning to be a musician, the process of learning to be a jazz performer, you know, whether that's go through music school or whatnot, you have somebody coming in through basically a different door somebody who is yeah. hired to be a classical conductor and so you know they take a young captain and and hopefully they have enough commercial and jazz sensibility that they can go in there and so so we tend to not get matched up with that they tend to let us be yeah. because none of the officers were really hired to be you know jazz people or commercial music people or rock people um yep. they, they were hired to be they were hired based on their audition conducting the United States Air Force concert band Mm -hmm. And um, that's not to say that, especially nowadays, most of the people coming in have more uh, versatility. I mean, there's a lot more versatility in, in young musicians coming up now than there was back in the day. I think the whole business is becoming less specialized. Uh, but, but no, you're absolutely right. There was a, definitely a degree of independence. But on the other side of the equation, uh, there was this view, and, and it, in many ways... It, turned out to be reality that the concert band got the best tour stops the concert band gets the most money sure. they get to do th their recording projects are more well funded they get more money for advertising for their concerts so so that's kind of the other side of that blade is that we had to go and really make the case for you know what we're trying to do is really going to make an impact it's going to affect a lot of people it's going to send that air force message and you have to keep going back to that to as many people as possible so so yeah there are advantages and there are a few disadvantages mm -hmm. yeah well that's really fascinating to hear that perspective that way yeah. really cool i'm going to talk about the mary Papper school of music because that's the most logical transition i can think of <laughs> and what i'm going to tell you is he that teed it up for you before lane. man no, he no. said something about how it always <laughs> comes back to pennsylvania and then he, he like he put it on a platter for you and then and you just mm -hmm. you punted it yeah 
So as I said, the Mary Pepper School of Music <laughs> at Duquesne University is a fantastic brass program. Lots of opportunities for young players to um, interact with some of the greatest uh, uh, orchestral musicians uh, going right now. And Jim Nova. And Jim and Jim Nova. And, uh, of course, James Corlay and Algaraz Matonas of the River City Brass. So if you would like to find out more about what's going on at the Duquesne University School of Music in the Mary Pepper uh, school, you can click on that link and super duper extra special thanks to Jim. Uh, I might have done this one before, but Jim, take it easy, baby. I worked all day and my feet feel just like lead Nova for making that possible. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Are you done? Yeah. <laughs> So, I have a dollar. Because I have to read my thing. It's I'm contractually required to read this. Are you ready? Oh, yeah, please. Yeah. <clears throat> Joe Jackson appears. Compliments of Earl Williams trombones. Earl Williams trombones. Out of business since 1973. <laughs> <laughs> what just happened? So, <laughs> I love it. So, Joe, we are, we're getting short on time here, and we, of course, need your, your advice on, uh, on, on Jens. We're going to get to that in a second, but just wanted to briefly touch on what you're, you're doing nowadays. Um, we just played a gig together with the American Festival Pops Orchestra like a week or so ago, and, uh, and a lot of that's jazz, but there's a lot of classical stuff. i got to say, if you kind of self-deprecatingly said that you're a jazz player who tries to play classical, if anybody just heard you play classical, they sure as hell wouldn't guess that you weren't primarily a classical player so how much classical playing do you do i'd say i'm up to well it depends on what you consider classical see sure. so that's always a bugaboo it's right. like like literally classical playing in an orchestra trombone playing that kind of repertoire that really doesn't ever happen right because there's probably in washington dc there's probably 40 people that are better at it than i am okay right. but doing something like what we did which is like you know pop stuff combined with light classical like mm -hmm. marches and stuff mm -hmm. like that um i'm up to about 15 to 20 percent that kind of stuff but if you consider like a rogers and hammerstein musical to be classical like you know uh, uh south pacific is that classical well you're playing a big horn you're trying to play big notes you're trying to play musically um kind of in the same vein as you would a lot of classical repertoire Right. For me, yeah, it sure as heck is because right. I'm I'm playing what for me is gigantic equipment and right. I'm you know, trying to get a warm sound and blend with other classical instruments. So if you include that, then I'm I'm at about fifty fifty at this point. Hmm. Um so I'm doing a lot more show work as you guys are aware. Uh the Baltimore, Washington DC area is absolutely the hidden gem of the musical theater world. There are there's a lot of theater work here to be had, and maybe I shouldn't be saying this because now there's going to be hordes of <laughs> of music school graduates with their horns coming in, riding giant boars. Um, uh, uh, that was a, probably a mistake. Yeah, we'll we'll edit that out. No, we won't. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I, I, my my career is like I was listening to your. You know, I'm a fan of the show. First time caller. Dude. And I, <laughs> First time, long time? But yeah, first time, long time. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was going back and listening to uh, the older, your historical repertoire of shows here. And um, <laughs> so I was like going, looking through the list, and it's like, when's the last time you had somebody like me on the show? And so I have to go back to Tom Gibson and Wes Funderburg. Um, those guys, probably most, especially Wes, his career probably most resembles mine. Mm -hmm. um, except that he's more of a big time arranger than I am. That you know, Atlanta pops thing. That was a that's a huge deal. Are your and, are um, your parents also devastatingly disappointed in you like his are? No, my parents no. are musicians. My dad, <laughs> like every time something good happens to me, I call my dad up and he just he gets so happy. He's like doing the little prospectors dance in Treasure of the Sierra <laughs> Madre. <laughs> You know, he's uh, like, he's like, he, 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 you done it. You done it. <laughs> I knew you'd find fifth position one day. <laughs> You're so stupid. You're stomping right on top of that gold. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness gracious. No, but, no. I, I'm like West, but with uh, affirming parents. 
<laughs> and I totally, I, I may have just completely made up Wes's relationship with his parents for my own amusement. But, you know. That's good. It, like, it made for 12 entertaining seconds. Yeah. <laughs> you never let the truth get in the way of a good story. That's so, right. Especially when it comes to Wes Funderburk. So, yes. yes. Um, and you do a, a lot of arranging and a lot of I, uh, in I composing. I quite a right? bit of arranging. Yeah. Uh, but I've been like shoehorn. I'm basically 90% of the arranging I do is transcribing. And um, I think I have a knack for it. Like I can, I can transcribe really complex stuff hmm. and um, pretty darn accurately. And I'm maniacal about like the accuracy of it. And like I, I never put out like a shit chart. Like everything is, I've got the arranger, the tempo, I've researched everything I can possibly research, the patch on the keyboard part. Um, and so that appeals to a lot of people. And so I've just gotten more and more and more like transcribing work, hmm. you know, whether it's big band charts, I transcribe a lot of big band charts. I transcribe a lot of pop tunes. Um, I do a lot of studio orchestra stuff. I've got one agency that thinks I'm a string writer. I mean, I, I started writing for strings like four or five years ago. And again, I just, I think strings are like, they're easy to write for. I don't want to trash people that write for strings professionally, but they're easy to write for in that there's not much that strings do that sound bad. Like you can make a lot of mistakes with string writing and it still sounds good because it's strings. Right. And so I, I get More hired forgiving. to write like string quartets and studio orchestra things with strings in it. And um, so it's, it's the, the arranging thing is interesting because it keeps going in unexpected directions. You know, I keep getting hired to do things and I keep saying yes. And especially if it's outside of my wheelhouse and then I get pulled into like, you know, different like identities as an arranger. Hmm. So, so that's been super interesting. And that's, I'd, I'd say arranging right now I'm at like 70, 70% performing 30% arranging. Um, and the arranging, it has its, you know, ebbs and flows it's like right now I've, there's nothing and then you know talk to me in a couple of months and i'll have like weeks and weeks and weeks of work piled up and can't see a way out <laughs> you know just sobbing and holding <laughs> myself in fetal position because i'm overwhelmed by the amount of work <laughs> i can't find the right patch <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah i'm like literally on youtube it's like what is that sound i know it's from the 70s it's like synth patch <laughs> it's that what clark rigsby calls the the funkifier the That's funkifier right. yeah the whitener. He, yeah he just says he can just yeah well no it's okay we'll just put that through the funkifier and he yeah. said a number of musicians have been like oh cool <laughs> thanks oh, man cool. Yeah. Oh, i can really hear that i can yeah. hear it yeah yeah <laughs> I just give up and say Fender Rose. <laughs> <laughs> whatever works. Yeah. Speaking of whatever works or whatever doesn't work, um, yeah, our dear friend Yen Flintsman's chops come to mind. So, um, mm. yeah, as you're as you're probably aware, uh, Yen's uh, has been uh, has been going through some chop problems for years now. Um, if you're new to the show because you just started Corey listening does. for the Sam uh, episode, he's actually not having chop problems, but we bust on him, and we'll, we'll explain it again sometime soon. But anyway, so Jens is uh, is undergoing these really serious chop problems, and, and you're like uh, you're incredibly enlightened with your attitude about like about thriving within an organization and how that can fuel the, the the artistic side of things, and it's like my head was spinning in a good way. So I think that you're uniquely positioned to maybe get Jens over the hump. So what advice would you give to Jens in this time of need? So, so here's the thing. You know, we were talking about this. Uh, I might have been talking about it with you. Um, so so we were talking about, like, the end of somebody's career. So, so there are the, these folks that, like, <laughs> you know, they, they start to get a little bit long in the tooth, as we say. And, um, and But they keep putting themselves out there and their skills are declining. And, and so they're on these gigs and they're getting like worse and worse and worse. Right. And then there's like another personality type where the moment they can't improve and the moment they can't, you know, still play on that level, they're just like the hell with this, you know, and they put the horn down and that's it. They just, they just quit. So I kind of think that's where Yins is at. He needs to like, he needs to plan for an orderly conclusion. <laughs> he he needs an career. end game. <laughs> you know, because there, there's a point at which, you know, and we will all get there. And, you know, 
<laughs> you two and I will be there someday. But you have to start planning for a, an ordered transition to retirement. And, you know, it can, it sounds sad, but it can be a joyous, you know, like a celebration of, of a job well done. I can't wait to visit him in the old folks home and bring yeah. him an iced tea or something. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, take him a, a PlayStation. You, know. you need an exit plan. That's a good idea. I like yeah. it, man. See, I knew that that was going to be pragmatic. It's like you've yeah, been I mean, trying to solve the wrong problem. <laughs> I, I don't have any chop advice. It's really more life advice. Like, yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. All right. Well, that that's that's a good one. So. This has been this has been wonderful, predictably wonderful, uh, Joseph. Thank you. The, thank you. And I lied on my resume. I don't actually own a euphonium. I'm sorry. Oh uh, well, it's okay. it's fine. No well, one would check that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah the, once you got the sympathy for that, then everybody just kept on moving. So um, <laughs> we are going to uh, to keep Joe on the line here for the bonus episode. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, our Patreon page, patreon.com slash the Brass Junkies, we have a bonus episode in the week after every episode airs. So one week from today, if you're listening to this the day it comes out, you will hear even more with Joe. And since Joe and Lance were in the Air Force at the same time, Joe knows where some of the bodies are buried with um, with Mr. LeDuc here. So we are about to, to get to some of that. But for as little as $1 per episode, you can uh, get access to that. So uh, patreon.com slash the Brass Junkies. And um, I think that's going to do it. Joe, thank you so much. And that is going to do it for another episode of the Brass Junkies. You've been listening to The Brass Junkies on the Pedal Note Media Podcast Network. If you would like to hear the bonus episode featuring today's guest, please visit patreon.com slash the brass junkies to learn how you can support the show and instantly access all bonus materials as well as gain access to a special patron only Facebook group. The Brass Junkies is produced by the amazing, wonderful, and truly inspirational Will Houchen. The theme music was composed by Fernando Dados and performed by Andrew Hitz and Lance Lidl. Duke. We are at Pray for Yens on Twitter and Instagram and have a Facebook page at facebook.com slash pray for Yens. You can find out more about the Brass Junkies and all the other Pedal Note Media podcasts at pedalnotemedia.com. This has been a presentation of the Pedal Note Media Podcast Network.